So my name is Kira Berger and I'm a speech language pathologist up at the University of Utah, not very far from here. Um, and I am in our HD Center of Excellence up there. I'm also actually, I wear many hats, um, primarily in research, but I also work in our ALS clinic and our MDA clinics. And I find a lot of the time I work with Swallow with all of the patients that I see. So I wanted to come and talk with everybody today. I was invited to come share a little bit about what Swallow is like in Huntington's disease and how it may change over the course of the disease as well. Um, so we had a little disclaimer here that this is, um, that I'm not going to present anything uh, that is, you know, you have to go do this. It's for information only. Um, and uh, there's no endorsements or anything in any of my slides for any particular items. I don't have any personal financial relationships that I need to disclose related to this presentation. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the first slide um, to get us all on the same page. What are we going to talk about today? So I'd like to sort of start out with what is what does normal swallow look like? Um, how HD can impact normal swallow. And I always kind of tend to put normal in air quotes because everybody has some variability, but kind of the average swallow, what does it look like? And then what can we do for an individual that has difficulty with swallowing when we're at home um, at the dinner table? And how can we make it a little bit safer? So I really wanted to start first with what is a speech language pathologist though? Because I get a lot of times I walk into a room and people say, well, I can talk just fine. I don't understand why I'm seeing an SLP. Um, we actually wear a lot of hats. We work primarily in either the schools or in a medical setting like myself. Um, and it isn't just about how well you can say your R's and your S's and your L's and all of that. <laughs> um, we actually get trained to assess, diagnosis, treat, and prevent when at all possible uh, any issues that may come up with speech, language itself, reading, writing, listening, talking, social communication, so those pragmatic skills, the cognitive component of communication, uh, and any swallowing disorders. And we do this across the lifespan. So I see from newborns all the way through um, people that are much older than any of us in the room. <laughs> so we cover a lot of ground. So to get us kind of on the same page, I have, and I promise there won't be a quiz afterwards, but I have up here a slide on what sort of normal physiology, uh, anatomy and physiology of swallow looks like. So to get us oriented, we have, oops, wrong one. Um, so our tongue here, main muscle, and it actually takes up all the musculature in our jaw is your tongue muscle. Um, and that, um, so our airway is in the front of our neck, our esophagus, a little hard to see from this angle, I apologize. Um, the esophagus is right behind our airway. Um, it, right in front of our spinal column. And it's a little hard to depict it in any p sort of static picture, but the esophagus is normally closed up at rest. So all of you right now, your esophagus is closed up unless you happen to be taking a sip of something. But, um, and we're just breathing in and out. Um, there's over 50 pairs of muscles that are involved in swallowing and speech. I can't leave that part out. <laughs> um, and those muscles work in a really finely coordinated fashion to, for us to swallow safely. So it starts with us maneuvering, manipulating food around in our mouth. Our tongue kind of um, moves food back and forth so it gets it under our dental um, surfaces and we can chew stuff up or it controls where liquid is in our mouth. And when we get ready to swallow, a whole bunch of stuff happens. Um, the first thing that happens is our tongue, the very front of our tongue, in most of us, anchors itself up right behind the front teeth. A few people, it's right below the bottom teeth, but most of it's up at the top. And then it sort of expands to fill this whole oral cavity area. And when it expands, it pushes food back and hopefully <laughs> all goes down the esophagus. Now, I mentioned a moment ago at rest, we're breathing in and out. Um, and you can see we use the same plumbing for both breathing and swallowing. We've all tried to do both at the same time. It never ends well, <laughs> and our lungs are not made to digest food. So our body, once food gets, um, is being moved back in our mouth and it gets to uh, the kind of the back part of our mouth, there's some landmarks back there that it gets near that triggers our swallow mechanism, the, the involuntary part of our swallow. And when that happens, um, our airway in the front of our, our 
the voice box area in the front of our throat kind of compresses, it moves up and forward, our vocal folds close up, we have some tissue right above there that closes up as well. And then um, the epiglottis that's listed here is actually just a little piece of cartilage that its job when that whole upper part of the airway moves up and forward is it flips over and acts like a little cap on top of our airway. So we kind of got three levels of protection for stuff to not go down um, the wrong tube. As that whole larynx, your voice box area, is moving up and forward, it pulls open or helps to pull open our esophagus. So now we've got a little slide, our esophagus is open, and the food can go right down. Um, uh, and I like to tell people that we don't usually think about it. Once we start moving food back in our mouth, we don't really think about where it's going. Our body does it for us normally and naturally. Um, and it should only take about two seconds. So it took me far longer to explain how a good swallow happens than what actually happens <laughs> in real life. Uh, so as soon as you start that swallow, it should hit your tummy in about two seconds. Um, and we do this over and over and over again throughout the course of a meal. Um, so it's a lot of coordination. We have to close off our airway and hold our breath for up to three seconds when we're swallowing. Um, and we do this again and again and again throughout a meal. And I, I always like to tell people that in our country, at least, average meal time is about 20 minutes. So plus or minus 10 minutes is pretty normal. Um, we've all had those moments where we're rushing somewhere and we're kind of shoveling it in, or those family dinners where we sit down and, and have a, a nice meal together may take a little bit longer. But just as a ballpark, that'll come up a little bit later in the talk. Um, the other piece that I forgot to mention but um, is important as well is that our, our soft palate, if you look in your mouth, most of us still have this little, I call it the hangy dang, it's a little uvula <laughs> that's in the back of our throat. Its job when we swallow is actually to lift up and block off the passage into our nose so we don't get food and liquid up in our nose when we swallow. So there's kind of a lot going on when we swallow and a lot that can get impacted with um, somebody who has swallowing difficulties. So terminology, dysphagia is the technical term for swallowing difficulty, and it can happen in any of sort of three-ish phases that we, we sort of describe. There's the oral preparatory phase where we're chewing things up or we're controlling that liquid in our mouth. There's the oral phase where we start to initiate the swallow, move food back in our mouth. There's the pharyngeal phase, so that's the actual throat part up above the esophagus and then the esophageal phase. And as I mentioned a moment ago, all of these can also be impacted by respiratory function as well since we have to hold our breath. So when I see patients, that's a very much a concern of mine when I am assessing their swallow. So HD in particular, many of you may know some of these things, but I kind of like to collect them all up in one area for us <laughs> so we can talk about it knowledgeably. There are a bunch of different um, symptoms that are present in HD that can impact our swallow function. So there's apraxia. This is a, an issue where we have difficulty sequencing movement. So if you're going to pick up a glass um, to bring it to your lips, you've got to finally coordinate how high you move your arm, how far you move it, um, um, how much you grip that glass, bring it to your lips and not your ear or something like that. Um, and apraxia can disrupt any of all of that sequencing part. There's the chorea itself. Um, I put these in alphabetical order, so <laughs> chorea is obviously one of the really important ones in HD. And those are those um, irregular, not under your own control movements that happen, that can happen at any time with muscles, that can also make it hard, not just in eating, getting food to your mouth, um, controlling that limb and that hand, but also you can have chorea of the muscles that are involved in swallowing as well. And so that can make um, things challenging. I put on here swallow and or speech because it's the same system for both, um, except for the esophageal part. Um, and I as a speech language pathologist, I can't leave the speech part out, but these can always affect the speech system as well. Um, there's dystonia, that's where we have those involuntary muscle contractions that you may have a hard time relaxing. I have patients that will like try and go grip a utensil and they can't let go of that utensil. That can happen with muscles in the swallowing system as well. Um, they can be repetitive and they can not just be in sort of your limbs or in your um, in the swallowing musculature, but also in your body posture, which can affect how safely you can eat as well. 
And then there's just muscle weakness itself. And this can lead to both dysphagia, we already talked about, that's difficulty with swallowing, and dysarthria. Again, I can't leave the speech part out of this, but dysarthria is a motor speech disorder, and it can, in HD, when we have mus muscle weakness, can result in people having not as much volume, they're maybe not as precise when they're speaking, their rate of speech may be different. Um, we've probably all seen this in persons that we know with HD, um, and it's related to all these other muscular changes that can occur in HD. There's also cognitive changes, as we know, in HD, and these can affect how safely we can eat as well. So the impulsivity that can happen, I have patients frequently that are being really rapid when they're eating and they're kind of chipmunking, is what my patients calls it, um, with food in their cheeks. And the more food we kind of get packed in there, the more difficult it is to manage it safely. And so that's very much a concern. There can be changes in attention as well. So somebody may be highly distractible. Uh, if the TV's on or the radio's on or there's a lot of conversation going on, that can make it more difficult to focus on that fine coordination of, of eating safely and swallowing. That's a little bit of a hard one because we are social creatures and we do like to have people around us when we eat. So I don't ever want to say that I ha my patient should be isolated in an area with nothing going on, um, but just limiting those distractions as best we can can help. And certainly there can be changes in memory in Huntington's disease as well, so it makes it difficult to learn new information and difficult to recall information that you've already tried to learn. So this can impact maybe habits that we're trying to establish to be more safe when we're eating. Um, and any or all of these symptoms can happen at any point in the disease. The literature commonly says, and I see it in our clinic as well, that when individuals are more mid-stage, that's when the dysphagia piece really kind of starts to hit home. But I have had some individuals where it may start early in their, where their prodromal phase even, or pre-manifest stage, stage um, and then get change over time as well. So. I originally had wanted to gear this talk as to, you know, how does it change, uh, how does dysphagia change over the course of the disease, but everybody is so variable and individual that it makes it challenging to do that. So I shifted focus a little bit to be more on describing swallow, what can we do to help it, and give you some ideas towards the end of things that we can do. So things that I look for when I'm seeing a patient, um, any patient that I see is, and I'm assessing their swallowing capability, is I'm looking at how well can they chew food up, how well that can they move food in their mouth um, or liquid in their mouth, do they chew everything thoroughly, do they have anything coming out the front, <laughs> um, and or do they have anything left in their mouth after they first swallow? So in my perfect world, um, which I try and live in, but I don't always practice, is once you swallow, everything is gone in that first swallow. So you don't have any residue left in your mouth, in your pharyngeal cavity, there's nothing hanging out in your esophagus. Um, and it's not uncommon when I'm working with many of the patients that I see for there to be residue left in the mouth. Oops, wrong direction, sorry. Then we have the pharyngeal phase, so the throat area. We can get, if that soft palate isn't elevating, we can get nasal regurgitation, food up or liquid up into the nose. And we've probably all had that as kids when somebody told a joke at the wrong time and we got milk up our nose or something like that. But this can actually be a serious issue with some individuals with dysphagia if that muscle isn't, those muscles aren't moving very well. Um, if somebody's having a lot of coughing or choking when they're eating in particular, um, or they're clearing their throat a lot while they're eating. Sometimes you can hear kind of a wet quality to somebody's voice or a gurgly sound to their voice, um, and that can be indicative of that there's residue in the back of the throat area. That coughing and choking is uh, our body's way of protecting us. So if stuff starts to sneak down into the airway, our body's normal reaction, especially if stuff gets in contact with um, our vocal folds uh, or go all the way down into our trachea, is we just start coughing really violently to use air to kick that food or liquid out. Um, and I like to tell people we've all aspirated. Everybody on the planet has aspirated at some point or another. Um, and you know, it's more a frequency effect. So if somebody is aspirating once in a blue moon, like most of us, then that's not as much of a concern, depending on what it is. Um, but if we're aspirating at every meal, stuff is sneaking into the windpipe every 
every single time we eat or many of the times we eat, that can present a health risk for sure. Um, if I have somebody who is um, taking one single bite or one single sip and they're swallowing, even small sip of water and they're swallowing three, four, five times to get things down, that's telling me that there's food uh, or liquid in their throat area and they're trying to clear everything and it's not being cleared very effectively. Or if somebody just flat out tells me, I feel it stuck in my throat, <laughs> then that's definitely a sign for sure as well. Um, there's a couple catchment areas in our throat that do catch food. Um, that little epiglottis piece that flips over and caps our larynx, it has a pair of pockets on either side of it that can catch food or pills. That's a common one that I hear from individuals. And the reason I bring that up is that sometimes in the esophageal phase, people will tell me, I have food stuck in my throat. And our esophagus is not very good about referring sensation. And so specifically, if we have food, uh, somebody tells me food is stuck here, kind of in that little semicircle that's right above our, our breastbone, it can usually be referred sensation from somewhere in the esophagus as well. So it's not always actually in your throat in, in many of our bodies. But certainly in this esophageal phase, if somebody's telling me they have pain underneath their breastbone substernally, or they're feeling full in this area, um, or if they're actually feeling the food and that it's taking a long time for it to pass through the esophagus, those are all signs and, and symptoms that I'm looking out for. Another big one for me, I mentioned earlier meal times about 20 minutes plus or minus 10. If I have people that are taking longer and longer and longer to eat a meal, that's a sign of dysphagia to me. So I've had some patients that take 45 minutes, an hour, two hours. Um, one patient in uh, our ALS clinic took four hours to eat a Subway sandwich while he was there on a clinic visit. That's too long to be having a meal. Um, we just as if we were going for a long walk, our muscles get tired over time. Same thing with swallowing. The more often that we're doing it, we get tuckered out. There's some newer data showing that we all fatigue while we eat. And so if you're taking a really long time to have a meal and you're fatiguing while you're eating that meal, there's the risk that this coordination of swallowing and breathing may be um, compromised and may make it more difficult for you to swallow safely. So I'll often ask people, how long does a meal take? How many meals do you do? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, a final slide on sort of some general signs of dysphagia, if we're regurgitating food, um, if it's coming back up. If we're having a lot of congestion or, or upper respiratory infections, that can be a sign that food has been sneaking down the wrong tube. And it, our body's mechanism, if we can't cough it out, is our immune system gets jazzed up and we spike a fever and try and treat it as something that's invading our body and we try and get rid of it through our immune system. So if people are having a lot of respiratory issues, a lot of fevers that they don't know what they're coming from, um, those are big concerns for me. And I'm usually tracking weight with my individuals that I work with as well. I'm not a dietitian. I work really closely with them in, in several of the clinics that I'm in. And we all monitor that if there's this unintentional weight loss that is consistent and significant, more than a couple pounds up and down kind of thing, that's definitely a sign that you're just simply not getting enough calories in. Sometimes these last ones can be related to something else. I always like to throw in a little disclaimer that if you do have some of these, you want to double check and make sure there's not something else going on. But. So for Huntington's disease in particular, in each of these different phases, there's some really unique symptoms that happen or characteristics of Huntington's disease that impact swallow. So that postural instability, if we've got truncal chorea, we've got movement going on, or we're in a, um, we've more maybe got some scoliosis going on or something like that, those can affect the ability to swallow safely especially if we're moving, um, and that means those muscles inside are being impacted as well. You may get some narrowing of the throat area that may make it harder for food to go through, especially if you're sort of hyperextending your trunk and your head. That actually kind of narrows that space in the back of our throat. Um, many of the HD patients that I work with get quite impulsive while they're eating and they may not chew very thoroughly as well. So they may take in something that is harder to eat and it may just go down as one big swallow and that can put us at risk as well. 
Um, the tongue itself can be a really challenging one um, for it in the setting of Huntington's disease could, for controlling the food, getting the food going when we start the oral phase of our swallow. And if there's any chorea as well, as I've had patients with dystonia of the tongue and chorea of the tongue and apraxia of the tongue, so these can all sort of affect it as well as just being weaker over time. Um, there was um, a review that came out a few years back that looked at a whole bunch of different studies. Unfortunately, the literature uh, in, of dysphagia and Huntington's disease isn't very big just yet. We're hoping to change that as we keep looking at it more. Um, but what they looked at is they looked at a whole bunch of studies and they said, what are some common characteristics uh, of Huntington's disease uh, as it relates to dysphagia? So there can be um, impairment in that sort of the propulsive phase when we start the swallow in our throat, in our mouth. Um, the swallow itself can be not very well coordinated. It can be that food goes too rapidly or liquid goes too rapidly through the throat and into, or through the mouth into the throat and that can put us at risk of stuff sneaking down the wrong tube because that airway is not closed up and protected. Um, some individuals may, along that same line, not initiate their swallow very well. They may hold it in their mouth for a really long time and then swallow all of a sudden. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, in my perfect world, I like there to not any, be any residue after a swallow, but sometimes we do in Huntington's disease. There was a lot going on in the pharyngeal phase. I promise I won't quiz you on this part either. <laughs> There's a lot of technical words in here. I pulled these directly from this review. So the coughing, choking that we saw earlier, the aspiration that we've been talking about, erectation, aerophagia, that's when we're swallowing air. It can lead to burping, um, and it can lead to getting air into the tummy and making us really uncomfortable. Um, it can also cause loud swallow. So if you have somebody that, you, a loved one that has a really loud swallow, sometimes it can be that they're swallowing air or they're really putting a lot of oomph into their swallow. Our larynx, that voice box area, may stay up too long as it moves up and forward during we, when we swallow. Um, it may also have difficulty descending in a smooth fashion. So I have some patients where it'll come up and then it kind of comes down in sort of steps. Um, and that means that airway is a little more unprotected during that time. Um, the attention, the impulsivity in Huntington's disease can lead people to um, do a lot of talking while their mouth is full of food. We've all done that, but <laughs> if we're, again, if we're doing it all the time, that can be more of a problem. Um, they may have difficulty coordinating, holding their breath when they swallow. These are all things we don't normally think about when we swallow, but Huntington's disease and the cognitive changes that come along with it can impact all of these areas. Food uh, in the back of the throat. Um, impaired UES function. The UES is our upper esophageal sphincter. So at the very top of the esophagus, we have about uh, maybe a two to three centimeter section where those muscles are, are tightly closed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they relax when we swallow. Um, sometimes that UES itself can have chorea, um, and it, or it may not be able to relax enough, so that'll lead to food backing up in our throat area. It can also lead to wet vocal quality, so food's kind of hanging out where we're trying to breathe on top of it. Um, the larynx itself, our voice box, can have chorea, um, and that's unique to Huntington's disease. Um, and that little piece of cartilage that flips and acts like a little slide may not tilt all the way down when it goes. It may get stuck on the back wall of our throat, or it just may not be as coordinated as it needs to be. Um, so these can be challenges in that pharyngeal phase. In the esophageal phase, um, again, all of these symptoms aren't necessarily super, super common, um, and not everybody's going to have every symptom, but these were just kind of in looking at all of these studies, here are some characteristics we found. So there may be vomiting, there may be an early sense of satiation, so they feel like they're full, but they're not really. Um, that there is documented that esophageal motility, normally our esophagus is just a big long tube and we have these muscles that kind of have a, like a, what we call a stripping wave that goes down to push food in front of it. And um, that motility may be disrupted. And so that may be a challenge to get food down safely. 
The diaphragm, we all probably remember from our biology class, is that big muscle right at the bottom of our lungs that helps us breathe. And our esophagus, um, our stomach is on the bottom side of that diaphragm, and our esophagus has to go through that diaphragm to get down to the stomach. And so if we have chorea of the diaphragm, that can impact that, the esophagus. Um, and we can also have reflux as well in Huntington's disease. So, giving you a lot of background on what is dysphagia, what is dysphagia in the setting of Huntington's disease. Um, what next, though? That's always the question I have. Somebody comes in and tells me that they're having swallowing difficulties. Well, where do we go from here? So, usually that means a swallow test, and I'll talk in a, a slide or two here about what some of the swallow tests are out there, but one of the things I like to get out of the way first is nobody fails a swallow test. My goal is not to be pass-fail with this at all. My goal is to say, what can you eat safely? What maybe gives us trouble? And how can we manage that situation? So when I do a swallow evaluation on somebody, I look for are there any particular consistencies that are better or easier for us? Any viscosities of liquids that are be better or easier for us? Um, is there any way we can work on how the person is positioned so that they're upright? If they have esophageal motility issues, we want to be more upright so that we let gravity help us out. Um, Maybe there's some strategies when we're eating. We put our food or our uh, fork down between bites to make it a little bit, um, add a little bit more of a pause in while we're eating. Maybe we do some exercises if that's appropriate. Um, and one thing I always really like to talk about when I do a swallow assessment with somebody is the idea of a feeding tube. Um, and as swallowing continues to change over the course of Huntington's disease, it's an end of life sort of discussion of what do we want to do about a feeding tube. In HD, they're not used very commonly, but some people do choose to do them. And I like to sit down with my families and really have an honest discussion of what does it look like with a feeding tube. It can be very helpful. It doesn't mean though, once you have a feeding tube that you can't eat by mouth. Um, so it's not an either or proposition. Um, and you know, somebody may choose to go the route of a feeding tube and then a little ways in they may say, you know what, I don't want this. We can take the feeding tube back out. There's multiple kinds of feeding tubes out there. Um, but I like to bring this up right when I'm doing that swallow assessment so we can plan for the future and what are our goals as a family and as a care team for the individual that's having swallowing difficulties. So when I first see somebody, I'm gonna look at their medical history, I'm gonna talk with the patient, I'm gonna talk with their care partner and see what is the history of issues that they've had with swallowing, what are some concerns they have in particular. Um, many people with HD have seen their family members with swallowing difficulties and so we kind of talk through some of that, that those aspects as well. Um, and then we can do a bunch of a, very, a variety of different types of swallow evaluations. One that I will do pretty frequently is a clinical swallow evaluation. So it's just right there in the clinic room. It's the easiest test. I just give you food and you eat. <laughs> it's not a complicated one. In that time, I'm watching not only, you know, what are you eating and how are you eating it, but how are all your muscles functioning? How's your respiratory status? How's your posture while you're eating? If somebody's helping the person eat, how are they doing that? There's a lot that goes on. So it may look really simple, but know that in the background, our minds are racing of, okay, how can we keep this as safe as possible? There's also, um, in continuing on with some other forms of assessment of dysphagia, there's the FEES, or fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, more commonly called FEES because it's easier to say, but this is where we stick a little camera up your nose and down into the back of your throat and we watch real time what your anatomy and physiology, what your anatomy is doing when you swallow. Um, there's also a modified barium swallow study. It, it's, it goes by other names, video fluoroscopic swallow study. Older nomenclature is a cookie swallow. Depends on where in the country or the world you are, it has different names. Um, this is where we take you to x-ray. We sit you down in a chair and we do that side view like I showed earlier and we want to have a video of you while you're eating barium liquids and solids and a tablet. 
and see where does stuff go? Does it go down the right tube? How much residue is left? Um, and the, with any of these assessments, we're really also, our job as speech language pathologists is to see how can we make it better? How can we be safer while we're doing this? There is also what's called a barium swallow study, and that is more a study of the esophagus itself, and they may scan the upper part of the um, swallowing system. The modified barium swallow is where we look at the top portion and we scan the esophageal portion. So sometimes those go hand in hand. There's some newer, relatively speaking, newer assessment tools out there. There's manometry where they take a thin catheter and they again up through your nose and down through your throat. They numb your nose so it's not horrible, but up through your nose, down through your throat and often into your esophagus. Um, and they can look at how well those muscles are contracting and whether do, they're doing it in a sequential fashion. Um, and uh, again, with different consistencies to see where things are going and how well we're managing. Uh, and then ultrasound as well. So just like we might do ultrasound on a, a little baby in utero, we can also use that to look at the soft tissues, the muscles that are involved in swallowing. Um, we can look at the structure of the muscles. Are they looking like they're supposed to, or has there been any changes in the fibers of the muscles? And then we can also watch dynamically as we swallow what those muscles are doing using ultrasound. These two techniques are not as commonly used these days, but I think they're going to become more common because it doesn't involve exposure to radiation. Uh, and it's also a little more portable. You can do this in the clinic like you could do fees or a clinical swallow. The modified barium swallow tends to still be kind of the gold standard in our field, but I think these other ones certainly have their place for sure. So we've done the swallow assessment um, and looked at the swallow function itself, but one of the other things that I look at and I really wanted to stress in this slide is that um, oral hygiene is super important. So these are tips from the American Dental Association on good oral hygiene, brushing your teeth, flossing, um, eating a healthy diet that doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. That's a hard one for some of us. <laughs> um, and then seeing a dentist regularly as well too. It helps if you have a dentist that is familiar with Huntington's disease, um, and that can be challenging to find, but I, my hope is these centers of excellence around the country are starting to build this sort of network of, of providers that can help, ancillary providers that can help us. But um, oral hygiene, the reason I throw this in here is that we can aspirate on food, um, but we can also just aspirate our saliva as well. And if we have a lot of bacteria in the mouth that's built up because we're not taking good care of ourselves, then that bacteria can go down the wrong tube and that can make us sick as well. So you don't, you don't necessarily develop an aspiration pneumonia just on food, it can be on your own saliva as well. So super important to have good oral hygiene. So then we get to the recommendations for diet. Um, this is sort of older nomenclature um, where we broke things into liquids and solids. I think of foods on this continuum of complexity. And in my view, puree items are right in the middle. So applesauce, yogurt, pudding, uh, things that are really homogeneous. Hummus can kind of be in there depending on how pureed it is. Um, and then you sort of go one direction where things get more um, less viscous, so you get to thin liquids, apple juice, water, wine, coffee, that kind of stuff like that. The other direction you go, you get towards what I call the whole meats, so steak, chicken, uh, other poultry, pork, that kind of, those kind of foods, breads, salads, raw nuts, other raw veggies, um, rice, popcorn, those are all really dry and more difficult to eat. So we naturally swallow stronger the more challenging the food is to eat, so if we, or the thicker, I guess, the food is to eat. So going from our thin liquid all the way up to our whole meat side of things, we swallow more strongly. Um, and But if we moisten things a little bit or we thicken things up a little bit, that can give us a little more sensory control. Um, and our body knows better, oh shoot, something's coming, I need to I need to prepare my airway to be safe and I need to get food down into my tummy with enough force. Um, so the older liquid, or the older terminology is for liquids. We had thin liquids, nectar thick liquids, honey thick, pudding thick. And then on the solid sides, we had this national dysphagia diet that went from puree, that middle thing, all the way up to the general foods. Um, there has been, and 
I was trying to figure out how to make this slide a little bit bigger so you could see it, but um, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative started, uh, gosh, it's probably been about six or seven years ago now, and they finalized their framework in November of 2015. This is a group of international professionals, so we have people from um, Australia and Asia and Europe and North America and South America and Africa all have come together to say, okay, we need to have some common language among us because um, you know, somebody in Japan may have a different view of what is mechanically altered versus somebody here in the U.S. versus somebody in Egypt versus, you know, so we said, okay, um, we need to figure out how to do this. So if you look at the IDSI standards, they're really well prescribed in terms of looking at how viscous something is. You actually can test this at home. You just take a little syringe and put liquid in there and see how quickly it drains out. And then on the food side of things, the solid side of things, it's how big are the particle sizes. Um, and again, it's really well prescribed. So if you're at all interested in it, it's certainly something to look up the ITSI standards. Um, the nice thing is, is it means that like if you have a loved one that is in a care facility and then needs to go to a hospital for a little while and they're on an ITSI diet, you can be more well assured that they're gonna stay on that same diet when they transfer to this other facility because it's more um, specified than the older system was. So the tips that I like to give people as well is how can we help somebody at home with swallowing difficulties? Um, and I think this is a big one that I work with with a lot of patients is how can we sort of manage the situation? Um, being upright at 90 degrees, as I mentioned earlier, so that our esophagus, um, we have gravity at our at our side to get food through our esophagus, but also through our throat. And um, sometimes that may mean we support that trunk a little bit more. And we get real creative with my physical therapists that I work with or occupational therapists in our other clinics um, to figure out how to keep that trunk more well supported. For some individuals, having somebody right there helping out while eating, maybe maybe feeding, but maybe also just helping guide while we feed while we eat as well. Um, using weighted utensils, sometimes that helps with some of the apraxia that goes on um, with Huntington's disease. Or I put up here adaptive plates. So they have these plates that have like a little bumper on the side of it. So you're not chasing food off the side of the plate. You have an edge to go up against. And you can also buy just a little bumper that you can put on any plate as well. And those are very handy uh, to, to help somebody still be independent while they're eating. Um, we're all safer if we do single bites and sips and smaller bites and sips. We're all guilty of guzzling stuff and shoveling stuff in, but um, it's a little bit safer for us if we kind of slow down a little bit and do a little bit smaller bites and sips. Um, I also put in here straws. One of the things that straws are not a panacea. They don't solve every problem. But for some individuals, when they go to drink, as they're like draining the bottom of the glass, they may open their airway even more. And if they don't have good oral control of that liquid, it can mean that we're putting ourselves more at risk of stuff sneaking down the wrong tube. So straws can help us out because they keep that chin parallel to the floor um, or even slightly tucked, which can, which can be helpful in many patients. Um, I always encourage people to try it and see if it works for you. Like I said, it's not for everybody. There's a few diagnoses in the world that it's absolutely the wrong thing, but in HD in particular, it does seem to be quite helpful. So if we have somebody that we're having dinner with and they're having difficulty with um, eating and some dysphagia concerns, we can maybe try and slow them down a little bit. Setting that fork down between bites, like I mentioned earlier, can, can help. The caveat with that is because of the cognitive changes that can happen, it can be challenging to establish those habits if there's been a lot of cognitive changes going on. So maybe establishing a little bit earlier uh, in the course of the disease. Um, limiting distractions. We're all safer if we don't talk with food in our mouth like our mom told us to not do. <laughs> so I always encourage that. Um, alternating a bite of solid with a little sip of liquid to help wash food down can be really important as well for many people. 
I caution people from getting too many mixed textures in the mouth at the same time. So if we have you know, some popcorn in our mouth and we've taken a sip of water and it's all in our mouth at the same time, that's a lot to manage because it's kind of two ends of the spectrum. Um, so you know, swallow the solid first and then take a sip of the liquid can help us be a little bit safer. I have some patients where we work on just limiting how much food is on the plate at a time. I'm not trying to starve anybody by any stretch, but you know, maybe controlling those portions so if we are a more rapid eater, we eat what's there and then we go back for a little bit more and a little bit more as we needed or as we need. With Huntington's disease, um, the caloric needs are quite high, um, especially with all the extra movements that go on with it. And so we don't we definitely want to make sure people are eating well. Um, and certainly if you see a bunch of food left in the mouth, and encouraging the person to swallow as well um, before they take another bite. That's kind of a hard one. But again, a good habit to establish earlier on in the course of the disease. Just a little reminder every now and again, hey, take a swallow first um, before you put another bite in. Um, when I mentioned meal times earlier, this is a really common thing that I recommend for my HD patients as well as many of my other patients that I see is having smaller, more frequent meals. So if meal times are taking a very long time, we want to maybe break it up a little bit so we get a lot of ca we still get our caloric intake met or needs met, um, but we aren't trying to do it all at once, sort of thing. And sometimes more in the neuromuscular diseases that I see, but I think it happens in HD as well. I'll have people that are more fatigued at the end of the day, so their swallow may not be as well coordinated and as safe. So sometimes I'll say. Oh gosh, maybe towards the end of the day, having more moist foods, softer foods to eat. So using a slow cooker, um, crock pot, kind of Instapot, pressure cooker, casseroles, those can tend to be easier to eat because we're just moving in that continuum just a little bit. So really my goal along with my families is to help them manage the situation so that the person that's eating is the safest they can possibly be. So I mentioned earlier about straws, tucking that chin can help. It kind of opens the back of the throat area. It helps protect that airway a little bit better. It pushes the tongue and that little piece of cartilage back a little bit more so we don't pocket things in there as well. Some individuals I may encourage things like using a head tilt or a head turn. Um, so for somebody that is maybe has a side that's a little bit weaker than the other side, turning to that weak side allows the strong side to really kind of help push food through a little more safely. Um, and it can also help getting food through the upper esophageal sphincter as well, uh, that, so you're not getting a lot of residue in the lower part of our back of our throat area. There's also some maneuvers that we can do in swallowing that can help keep us a little bit safer as well. So we, uh, commonly in my field, we call it an effortful swallow or I'll tell patients a hard swallow. Put some oomph into your swallow as if you've got like a big glob of peanut butter that you're trying to get down. This, um, as I mentioned earlier, you swallow more strongly the more sort of thick something gets. So if you um, sort of tell yourself, gosh, I'm swallowing something thicker, you're going to put more strength into those muscles and swallow a little bit more strongly and help clear things out a little bit better. There's also um, a bunch of different swallowing techniques, and if we want to practice, we can. <laughs> I know we will in just a few minutes when we have lunch as well, <laughs> but um, there's what's called the superglottic swallow. So this is um, a technique that you can use where I keep mentioning we have to hold our breath when we swallow. So this is a more conscious sort of way of swallowing. You say, okay, I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to swallow. I'm going to clear my throat. <clears throat> and then I'm going to swallow again. So that coughing, clearing the throat can help kick stuff out of the airway if it happens to sneak down the wrong tube. Um, and then when we swallow again, it gets it out of the back of the throat area and, and makes us a little bit safer. These are things that um, if we want to be using them in Huntington's disease, we should start practicing them kind of early on so that we have that habit ingrained, we know what this is. So if we need to use it and rely on it, we, we have it in our back pocket. Yeah.
Right, right. Great question. So I'll repeat it just so we get it on the camera. So the question was, um, with the superglottic swallow, oops, let me get back to that. With the superglottic swallow, is this an exercise that we do, or is this something that we can do while we're eating? And it's actually kind of both. There's a newer paper that just came out that's actually indicating you can use this while swallowing as well, too. I hear your point, though, of, you know, if you have food in your mouth and you're telling somebody, okay, hold your breath, they're going to and potentially suck food down while they're doing it as well. So that's where learning it, I think, early on. So maybe doing nasal inhalation as opposed to through the mouth. But thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. Um, these also have historically in my field been used as exercises as well to help, help strengthen swallow. But this, many of these you can actually do while you're eating as well. I always say use it with caution a little bit because I don't want to get somebody too tuckered out while they're eating for sure. Um, so. So that, that was the superglottic swallow, and not to be outdone, somebody came up with the super superglottic swallow. <laughs> so this one is one where it follows the same pattern, except that um, before we swallow, we kind of bear down. We're really sort of engaging that musculature um, to bear down. So we hold our breath. We kind of bear down almost as if we're, you know, like trying to do a push our upper body up with our elbows kind of thing on the arm rest of our chair. We swallow, clear the throat, swallow again. Again, this is something that you can do. It's not my favorite to do these with people all the time. Um, I think of them better as exercises, but in Huntington's it can be used as a way to help be um, protective when we're swallowing. So that's something that you, one can do. And then there's the Mendelssohn. Um, this is one that I haven't historically done uh, while somebody's eating, more as a swallow exercise. Um, but this is one where when you start to swallow, that larynx moves up and forward. The, for the Mendelssohn maneuver, what you do is when you get to the height of your swallow, so that larynx is all the way up, and you can feel your voice box, your Adam's apple, move when you swallow. When it gets to kind of the height of the swallow, you hold it there for a few seconds to let things drain, basically, is one of the things. Um, and then you can finish your swallow. So if you do a normal swallow, you can kind of feel on yourself that little Adam's apple move past your fingers. And then in the Mendelssohn, what you do is you, fe you can feel it again, and you're holding it up with the muscles inside your throat, not with your fingers kind of trying to push it up. <laughs> Um, but really just the muscles inside, um, you hold it up. These are great, both the, the, well, all of them, the super, super glottic, the super, super glottic, and the Mendelssohn are all really good ones for help strengthening as well. There's not a ton of literature, unfortunately, out there just yet on, you know, how much exercise to do in the setting of Huntington's disease and how often and all of that, unfortunately. Um, it's something we need to be moving towards as a field, but these maneuvers can be helpful during the swallow as well. All right. Okay, and then I just had some references on here as well. And are there any questions? Yeah. Let me pull that, get that slide back up here. So the advanced diet is more what you're thinking of as the mechanically soft. Um, so let me repeat the question. I apologize. We, <laughs> excuse me. We didn't get the microphone there in time. We were talking about the national dysphagia diet, and we were asking whether the mechanically altered was the same as mechanically soft. Um, so the mechanically soft is more towards the advanced, so the dysphagia 3 diet. Um, the mechanically altered is where it's really finely chopped, not completely pulverized and blenderized and all of that, but th um, think like meatloaf um, consistency. Does that help answer? Okay. Other questions at all? I could do a quiz. No. <laughs> yes. Oh, hold on half a second. She'll grab a microphone for you here. Oh. I think somebody else was ahead of me, but... Where can we find it for more information about how to do these various exercises? 
Okay, so where can we find more info about how to do the various exercises? Your um, speech language pathologist should be able to help out with that for you. Um, not every center of excellence has one. Usually most hospitals do have one somewhere. They just, it may not be in that center of excellence. Um, so your SLP is probably your best bet on that. Um, some parts of the country, OTs will do this as well, occupational therapists, but yeah. There's a question right up in the front in the white, yeah. You talked about the um, patient projecting food out with their tongue. Is there anything you can do to prevent that or stop that? Um, Unfortunately, that one's a little more challenging because it can be oftentimes related to that chorea, so it's just going to kind of happen when it happens. Um, sometimes you can manage it by having maybe uh, more moist foods that stick together a little bit better. Um, so if you think like potato chips or, or Doritos or something like that versus, um, you know, like um, cottage cheese or something, that's going to be the, the more dry stuff's going to come out more easily. Would it help to put the food back farther on the tongue? It can. Um, sometimes with little ones that I work with, putting it in the cheek can help as well too. But it can. The, the, a little bit of the risk with the putting it further back on the tongue is that it may be far enough back that um, it may accidentally slide down um, and before our airway is closed and ready for it. So part of our tongue's job and it, our mouth is to kind of act like a little dam in the back of our mouth. Um, and so if we put food back there, the chance that it goes down the wrong way can be challenging. It's something to play with, but yeah, cautiously. Yeah. Um, my son, is his posture is, is extremely slumped over. Mm -hmm. You talked about tucking the chin or keeping it parallel. Um, I wonder, uh, sometimes I think that maybe it's best to lean him back. His chair leans quite a ways back. Is that dangerous or helpful? It, well, it, it very much varies by individual. That's a great question. I have had some patients where getting them tilted back just a little bit does help make it a little bit safer. I will work really closely with the occupational therapist that I am lucky to work with and see if there's a way we can support that posture a little bit more. It's hard if we've really got a lot of scoliosis or kyphosis going on um, to get somebody sitting upright, but there is... Um, Occasionally, we do have issues where people are so far tipped over that stuff can sneak into the airway from a timing issue. Um, so that might be one where you do a modified barium swallow study and look at it real time and try the different positions and see what works. Yes, hang on for the microphone. <laughs> As a caregiver, there have been times where my husband will eat something that he's eaten, you know, a hundred times before. And on this particular day, for whatever reason, that food might cause him to choke. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help him when you know, our loved ones are in that situation where they're, they're kind of, the food is stuck, where they're choking? Right, right. Great question. And that's, the, that's one of the scary things about dealing with dysphagia is that sometimes it just happens. And it, to step back a little bit, um, we all have those moments where you know, we've eaten hot dogs forever kind of thing, and one time we get it go down, down, going down the wrong tube or something like that. I do encourage my caregivers, along with um, my respiratory therapist that I work with, that you know the Heimlich maneuver. Um, so just in case you need to use that, um, or using a cough assist machine or something like that, depending on what's um, medically recommended. Um, I also will, um, in those moments, certainly if, while they're coughing, if they can cough, if they have a strong productive cough, encourage them to cough it out. Um, Sometimes giving a little bit of moisture, maybe a little bit of applesauce or something like that um, can help um, push that food back down. I always use that sort of cautiously because that coughing is often indicative of that it's trying to sneak in the airway. And if our system's working really well, giving them something to eat or drink is going to go down the other tube. It's not going to go down into the airway. So really coughing is kind of the best one and, and knowing the Heimlich. But um, I also like to step back and say, what was about that situation that was different as well? So was it later in the evening and we were tuckered out? Was there a lot of distraction going on and so we couldn't focus on doing it safely? Were we in a hurry because we had to run out the door and sort of see how else we kind of put ourselves in this situation, if that makes sense? Sense. Yeah. Yeah, you've got the microphone coming. Yeah, great. Uh, a question about the dystonia. 
<laughs> that a person may not be able to relax a muscle that's involved in the eating process. How does one, is there an exercise that one could use to work those muscles so that they... There, that's a great question. There is not a lot of literature about that. Um, I work with a lot of neuromuscular diseases as well that have similar concerns. And there's not, in some, there's some medications that you can use, but we don't use them in HD because um, it's a different mechanism that's, that's happening. Um, so oftentimes it's just kind of waiting it out, unfortunately. And then you also mentioned about turning if there's a weaker side versus the stronger side. Mm -hmm. So if, say, the left side is weak, do I turn the person towards the left side so that the right side is? Yep, it's the strong side and you can capitalize on that. So that um, came from the stroke literature actually originally. So in a stroke, you have one side of the body that may be weaker than the other because of how the stroke has happened. And so we very much found in rehabilitation with after a stroke, turning to that weak side can really help with that strength. Um, and for some people with HD, they're asymmetrical enough, so they may have a weaker side. So same idea. And one other thing with Please. the straw. I found that if the straw was kept close to the front of the mouth, it was easier to swallow. Perfect. If the opening of the straw was towards the back of the mouth, that would cause some choking. Yep. And my hunch is that that damming mechanism that I was talking about earlier, right? You get the straw too far back and that thin liquid, we don't, we kind of take water and things like liquids like that for granted and we just sort of let them trickle sometimes. And so, yeah, if you have that straw too far back, that can be challenging. And I would never stand up next to the patient eating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've all learned that one too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, another couple questions. Hi, um, I have HD and a lot of times I have problems uh, when I try and take my medicine. I, it's, but they taste bad because what happens is I try and swallow the medicine and with the water, sometimes it takes too long for, for me to swallow so that they dissolve. So all the flavors of like all my medicines are, it's so gross. Yeah. Is there anything I can do to like make it easier? For sure. So sometimes um, I, what I think about with meds in particular or vitamins is you've got this hard thing and you've got water. So you've got things at two ends of the spectrum and it's kind of hard to control them. If we're have di having difficulty initiating the swallow in a timely fashion, then we do. I hear that very commonly. The, okay. the meds, the coating kind of comes off and it leaves this horrible taste, especially oh, yes. if you've got multiple at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what we commonly do in my field is we'll have people take it instead of with water take it with a bite of puree so applesauce or yogurt or pudding we naturally swallow a little stronger with that the consistencies are closer together so we're not trying to manage things that are too disparate okay. and that can help a lot so just take a bite of applesauce on a spoon put your pill on there and try that okay thank you yeah thanks great question and we had one behind here Ooh, bendy straw better than a straight straw. I tend to like the bendy straws in particular for my patients, but I have had some that really like these straight straws, like on these lovely mugs that, <laughs> that are here at the conference. Um, it really is personal preference. Um, in HD, it's not as much of a concern um, for the respiratory support. Res respiratory support can be decreased, but like in my ALS clinic that I work in, the larger bore straws tend to be easier, and those tend to be straight straws. Um, so people, I encourage people to try it and see. <laughs> yeah. Other questions at all? Oh, yeah. You guys are great with the questions. Thanks. Um, with the speech and language therapists, are there special ones that are trained for this or like we live in more of a rural area so we come in for the HD excellence clinic um, but not often enough for like the practicing and that kind of thing right. so I work at a school could we go to that speech th therapist or are, does it have to be a specific kind of, that's trained in this that is a great question so Part of our graduate school training is in everything. So we get this broad spectrum, but as we get out into the field and we practice, we really focus and narrow our focus a lot. So I see you know, Huntington's disease and ALS and any of the muscular dystrophy um, diseases. Um, I've worked on rehab in the past, so I've done a lot of swallow stuff. Oftentimes, 
oftentimes school-based SLPs don't have to work with feeding and swallowing nearly as much as I do. So while we have the same training going out, we've kind of diverged uh, over time. So I'm in Salt Lake City, but our catchment area is huge. We get Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, um, Nevada, Arizona. So we get kind of everything. And there's a lot of SLPs in the rural communities that I just talk with and, and we come up with a game plan because the average SLP, even in a medical setting, maybe sees a handful of HD patients in their career. Um, certainly a school-based one usually never sees one unless there happens to be a juvenile one there, um, which is even more rare. And so coming to a center of excellence where I see, I, you know, I have 50 patients that I know pretty intimately at this point, um, or my ALS clinic where there's over 300 that I've seen, um, then that's where you get the specialization. So it's a little bit hard though for these rural areas and most of us at these centers do tend to be available for outreach as well to help. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer questions. Let me put my email back up there at the very end here. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me as well and we can chat. Other questions at all? I love it when they have me do a talk like this right before lunch, because I'll be watching. I'm <laughs> just saying. <laughs> right? <laughs> we'll see how well you pass. <laughs> now, if I'm coughing, you can catch me on it, too. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much.